Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Offenses are everywhere. It's amazing how many opportunities we can have in one month to be offended. You don't have to take offense, though. Just because it's offered, you don't have to take it. And that's where we need to get smart enough to say, no, thank you, devil. I've had enough of that in my life. I think I'll pass this time. I think I'll just believe the best and go on and enjoy my life. We get offended at God. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. We become offended at ourselves because we don't do what we want us to do. Even God's word can offend people if they don't want to hear it. God's word is truth. And one of the things that I want to talk about today is how people get offended by the truth. All over the Bible, the Bible is, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. We can't go to the next level unless we receive truth about the level that we're on. I shared last night that in the beginning of the year, I felt like that God put a really strong thing in my heart. Joyce, if you're going if you're gonna complain about something, then don't bother to pray about it. Now, that wasn't God just trying to be mean to me. I honestly believe that God has got some greater things for this ministry to do. I believe that God's got a greater still anointing. More people to be reached in places maybe where the gospel has not even been yet. Listen, I'm not, I have not, I've not gotten too old to stop dreaming. I mean, I'm still dreaming dreams and seeing visions and wanting to help hurting people. But let me tell you something. Every time you want to come up higher, a little bit more of your flesh has got to go down lower. Every time we're going to come up higher, we're wanting God to give us more. We want to be responsible for more. We want more privileges. There's always another side to that of God showing you then. See, if I'm on this level, and I'm doing okay here, and I'm living my life in such a way that whatever evil spirits function on this level, I'm keeping them away. So everything's going cool. I'm doing all right. But now I'm saying, okay, God, I really want to get into, and, and we, you know, we've got a few countries before God where we want to get into, and a couple of them are places where the gospel just isn't. I mean, you just cannot get in there. And so here I am praying, asking God to open those doors for us. Where I've even told my son, I want you to go there, start poking around, start getting our books translated into some languages there. I don't care if you got to get in the underground church, start getting them around. We got, we got to do something there. Okay, now, there are other kinds of demons over those areas. And don't make a face because I'm talking about demons. All you got to do is go read the Bible. Jesus dealt with the devil all the time. He cast out demons. He dealt with the devil. There are angels that protect us and watch over us. But the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Amen. Amen. There was a demon principality and power that was over uh, the place where Daniel was, and he asked God for something, and he had to keep praying for 21 days while the angel that God sent broke through the principalities and the powers over that area in order to bring that answer to Daniel. So, demons, devils. Well, let me tell you something. The devil is not just some dude that comes out on Halloween in red pajamas carrying a pitchfork. The Bible says that the enemy will come and try to take the word away from us, and he does it through stirring up trouble in our life. He wants us to focus on that trouble rather than focusing on what God is asking us to do. So maybe, just maybe, down here I can complain a little and get by with it because maybe what I'm doing here, you know, there's, you know, it's not. I got these guys at bay anyway. But now if I'm going to come up here and try to get into this higher place with God and operate in these realms where the devil's had a strong... You know, I go out of the country. I go preach in places where there are very big re false religious strongholds. And I know what happens. I've seen what happens. I have felt the attacks and seen the attacks. So don't think that those things are not real. And if, if we're going to go and take that ground, then there is a price that we have to pay. And that price is normally letting go of more fleshly stuff so we're closer to God because the closer we are to God, the less the enemy can do to us when we operate in these different realms. Is anybody there? Amen. 
And this must be God for somebody because I had zero Zippo intention of getting into this this morning. That was not anywhere even remotely in the realm of what I'm trying to talk about. But we need to understand that when God is putting his finger on something in our life, it's because he's trying to get us ready for the thing that we've asked him to do. But in fact, if we don't let him do what he wants to do in us, we would never be prepared to go to that level. Yeah. Amen? Here's the way I like to say it. God has got an amazing place prepared for you. You say, well then, what is going on in my life? He's preparing you for the thing he has prepared for you. You say, well, this isn't preparing me for anything. It just hurts. No. <laughs> Trust me, honey, it's preparing you for a lot of things. People say, used to say to me when my ministry first got popular, because it was like, I mean, I'd been teaching home Bible studies for five years and working for somebody else for five years in a church. And then, you know, all of a sudden, Joyce Meyer, I went on TV. Who is that? Where did she come from? We never heard of her. Well, let me tell you something. Just because nobody ever heard of me, that didn't mean I wasn't anywhere. I was somewhere on the backside of nowhere <laughs> being dealt with and dealt with and dealt with and dealt with. The truth that God brings to us in our life is absolutely, amazingly wonderful. Let's thank God for the truth that he brings to us. So can anybody here say that God has dealt with you this weekend uh, to really deal with this stuff about offense? Okay. You know what? God's doing that not under condemnation, but because he loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you. And he wants you to get, that, get rid of that spiritual hangnail. That's what I said last night that offense is. It's like a spiritual hangnail. He wants you to get rid of that spiritual hangnail because maybe he's got a promotion for you at work. Maybe he's got something else for you to do in ministry. Maybe he's got another level of financial blessing for you. You know, just having more money is not all there is to it. There's always tests that come with that. Sometimes people want more, but they're not prepared to have more because if they had more, it would make them love the thing more than they love God. And that's not what God wants. We have to always be willing and ready to keep God first before he can give us more stuff. Now, being offended prevents progress. And you know, Jesus was always trying to tell people the truth. And people were always being offended by the truth. In Luke chapter 15, they got offended because he was a friend of sinners. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he's my friend. And I'm glad he's the friend of sinners. But the Pharisees didn't like the fact that he ate with publicans and sinners. They didn't like the fact that he invited sinners, preeminently wicked sinners, to come in and listen to him preach. They didn't like that. They got offended. So you know what happened? The Pharisees couldn't hear anything. But the sinners got the truth, and it set them free. Satan is the one that instigates offense. He's always trying to get somebody offended. Let's go to John chapter 6. I want to show you something. I would like to encourage you to read John chapter 6, verses 48 through the end of the chapter. Read and study them for yourself. But the first thing that says in verse 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that gives life. I am the living bread. Your forefathers ate manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. Well, what's that all about? But this bread that comes down from heaven is so that anyone may eat it and never die. I myself am this living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. <laughs> and also the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews angrily contended one with another, saying, how is he able to give us his flesh to eat? Now, Jesus went on and on like this. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, if you take me for your living bread and you take me for your living drink, you will never hunger again and you will never thirst again. They got mad. Who can be expected to listen to stupid teaching like this? This is ridiculous. Now, he starts out saying, your, far, your forefathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. 
Now over here, he's saying, you need to learn how to take me for your all. I gave them miracles. That didn't keep them satisfied. I want to give you not what I can do for you, but I want to give you myself. Now, come on, hang with me. I believe with all my heart that in John chapter 6, there's a great transition that we see that has to take place in the believer's life. We come into a relationship with God, and everything is what God can do for us. And that's okay for a while. I need a miracle. I need a healing. I need, I need, I want, I want, I need, I want, I want, I want, I need, I want, I want, I want. Oh, God is so good. <laughs> All the time. God is so good. All the time. <laughs> and then starts coming some of this truth. I remember when I thought every problem I had was somebody else's fault. <laughs> and God actually said to me, you're the problem, they're not. And over the years, I heard things like, you have a bad attitude. You wallow around in self-pity all day. You're easily offended. You're hard to get along with. Well... And I'm going to tell you the truth. If I would not have received those things from God, and I'm saying I did it immediately. I'm not saying I did it easily. Sometimes it took a month, two months, three, six, a year. That God's pretty stubborn. He'll stick with you. Amen. Amen. But I'm telling you the truth. I would not be standing here today if I was still back wallowing around in all those same problems. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let me, let me tell you how I started preaching. God called me to teach, and he put a burning fire in me to share the word. And I had an anointing to do it from the get-go. I'd always been able to talk my way in and out of just about everything, but I was just using it in the wrong way. Now God gave me this anointing to preach. Now, for five years, I sat in my living room floor, taught the Bible to about 25 people that would come from the neighborhood from my church. And I mean, they would come through blizzards. They would come through storms. I'm telling you, it was anointed. We had our little guitar player, and we would pray for each other. And, you know, it was back when everybody had these home meetings, and it was just so awesome. Some of you don't remember that, but it was really a great time. Now, when I started preaching, I would sit in the floor, and I would have on short shorts. I'm talking as short as I could get them. <laughs> and... <laughs> Blowing smoke in everybody's face, the whole entire... I mean, there would be so much smoke in the room that you couldn't even hardly see the people. <laughs> and it was anointed. You're like, oh, get out. I don't believe that. You know why it was anointed? Because God not only saw where I was, he saw where I was going to be. If he, now, wait. Wait a minute, and then you can really shout. He saw that if he accepted me where I was and didn't reject me and tell me I had to get all fixed up before he was going to love me, that then I would fall in love with him enough that I would be willing to lay those things down for him, and then he could have his way in my life. Woo! Come on. So it doesn't do any good for somebody to sit out there and say, well, I wish I had a ministry like yours. I didn't get it wishing. I got it sometimes wanting to run away from God so bad that I remember laying in my office floor and holding onto the legs of the furniture to keep from running away from God. It's not always easy when God gets in the middle of you. Because we live a lot of deception. Well, it's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's the way I was raised. If I would have had parents, if I wouldn't have been abused, if, 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 if. And God comes in and says, look, none of that stuff was great, but let's don't use it as an excuse to act bad our whole life. How about if you let me fix all that? How about if I redeem you? How about if I give you double for your trouble? How about if I show you how this thing really works? Amen. And so every one of those things that I received, that truth that I received from God, 
Oh, man, it was like a deep cutting knife in my soul sometimes. Because I would hear, you need to respect your husband. How can I respect men when I had at least seven different men that sexually abused me? How can you ask me to do that? Because God didn't want me punishing Dave for what somebody else did to me and every other man that I ever met in my whole life. And my soul screamed out, but it's not fair. What about me? <laughs> and of course, the message from God is always, you do what I'm telling you to, and I will take care of you. Yeah. Amen. When I think about where I could still be, when I think about how wretchedly miserable my Christian life could have been, and yes, you can be not only a miserable sinner, but you can be a miserable saint. How wretchedly miserable my life would have been had I not received that wonderful truth of the Holy Spirit when he continued to just be after me with this little thing and that little thing and this thing and that thing. I mean, the Holy Spirit went to the grocery store with me. And for years, he would follow me around the grocery store. Put that back. Put that cart back. Don't act like that. Don't be impatient with that clerk. I learned so many lessons in the grocery store. I, didn't, I couldn't go to Bible college. I had three little kids. I didn't have any money, but I went to the school of the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you what, that'll work better for you anyway. It's learning how to be led by the Spirit everywhere that you're at. And this being led by the Spirit is not just, ooh, 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 ooh. Did you feel it? Ooh. Oh, I got goosebumps from the top of my head. Well, probably the air conditioning vents blowing on your head. <laughs> Jesus didn't die to give us goosebumps. He died so we could be formed into the image of Jesus Christ and get out in the world and represent God in a way that's going to bring glory to him. <laughs> Amen? And I love God, and I love the Word, and I love it when the Holy Spirit won't leave me alone, and He confronts me, and I say to Him, I don't care if you've got to tie me to the altar, I want you to have your way in my life. Let's get over this attitude of, oh, another thing that's wrong with me. I'm so sick and tired of having something wrong with me all the time. <laughs> and every time God shows us something wrong with us, now we've got to go on a three-week vacation of guilt and condemnation. <laughs> run around and feel rotten about ourselves because we think that's the way we pay for it. God doesn't confront us so we can feel guilty. Yes, there may be a godly sorrow that we feel like, oh God, I'm so sorry. But that leads us to repentance and as soon as there's repentance, there's change and there's renewal and there's refreshing. <laughs> Amen? So here in John chapter 6, Jesus is saying, okay, I took care of them and they still died out there. We need more than a miracle seven days a week. We need more than for somebody else to come along and do it for us and for God to make everything easy for us. He said, here's what I want now. I want a transition. I want you to stop worrying about what I can do for you for a while and find out what you can do for me. Wonder how many people came here today thinking, God, I got, you got to do something for me. <laughs> I need a miracle. <laughs> I need a word. Hey Amen. I, I need Joyce to give me a word. And don't you dare go home and say, God, you didn't give me a word. <laughs> He's given you about 100,000 of them. So anyway, Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. I'm what you really need. Take me for your everything. Take me for your all. When we take Jesus as our everything, everything else comes with it. <laughs> He's the owner and the heir of all things. We are joint heirs with him. Everything that he has becomes ours when everything that we have becomes his. How about if somebody just throws your life wide open to God and you say, God, I'm tired of dancing around these same mountains over and over and over and over again. I'm tired of the foolishness. I'm tired of being mad all the time. I'm tired of being aggravated and frustrated and upset and unhappy and discontented and unsatisfied. I want your will in my life, and I don't know what that's going to take. It scares me to even think about it. But God, whatever you have to do in my life to get me to where you want me to be, I am telling you now, I surrender all. I'm... <laughs> Woo. 
And sadly, look at John 6, 6, 6. <laughs> and my personal opinion is it's not an accident. <laughs> and after this, <laughs> many of his disciples drew back, returned to their old associations, and no longer accompanied him. We're fine as long as it's all me, 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 me. But when God starts calling for that transition, <laughs> when he starts saying it's grow up time, you know we all have a time of courtship. I mean, I had mine. God touched me back in February of 1976 in an amazing way. And maybe it wouldn't have been amazing to you. I don't know what it was to me because I was one dry, thirsty soul. And I was born again. I went to church all the time. I worked in the church. But, I mean, nothing was working at home. And I cried out to God in my car, God, you have got to do something. I cannot go on like this anymore. And God touched me and filled me with his presence. And, I mean... For weeks, I was drunk on the love of God. <laughs> I loved weeds. I mean, I'm telling you. I just love, I would look at people I couldn't hardly stand and think, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, God created you. I love you. I love you. I mean, I had people saying, what is wrong with you? I mean, I was leading people to the Lord. I was praying for people in the bathroom at work, leading them to Christ. I mean, I was just like out of the box. Oh. And I don't know what happened. <laughs> but all of a sudden, the honeymoon was over. <laughs> and the marriage started. Then I started finding out some things that was going to have to change. And see, we always want to go back to that, well, I remember the days. <laughs> People, I remember the good old days. I tell you, honestly and truly, they were fun, but they really weren't the good old days. I'll tell you what the good old days are now when God gets in the middle of you and won't let go till he gets to do what he wants to do in your life. That's the good old days. Because those are the days that are going to change us forever. And I don't want to be part of John 666. I don't want to be one of the ones that when God comes to me with a hard truth, with something that's hard for me to hear, and they said, if you, if you read the whole thing, they said, this is a hard and an unbearable message. Who can be expected to listen to this? I'm supposed to let go of the, of the manna in the wilderness, and now you want me to actually take you for my everything and, and take you for my all, and you want I, I'm supposed to know what I can do for you? <laughs> Well, that's, just, that's a hard message. And many of his disciples drew away. But thank God, he turned. To the 12, verse 67. Will you also go away? And do you also desire to leave me? Maybe we're about to find out why they were one of the privileged 12. And here it comes. Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen. You know, let's don't be offended when the truth of God's word shows us a problem area in our lives. The truth will always set us free if we will receive that truth and apply it in our lives. Then we'll experience spiritual growth and lasting change. You know, some people don't do well with real straightforward teaching because it kind of starts to mess in their lives a little bit, but it's so good for us to just really let the Holy Spirit in and say, anything that you want to change in my life, I want you to change it.